which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at these things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen just as it had been told. Wow. Amazing. You see, as I mentioned, the shepherds weren't seen as the most important society people. They weren't seen as the people that, wow, you would be the ones who would get the first invitation to come and see something special. But we find that God announces his birth here. But he announces his birth to a people that I think the first hope we want to look at is I believe it was an imperfect hope. An imperfect hope. Because here in Luke chapter 2 verse 8 it says in the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields keeping watch over their flock by night. I think the shepherd's number one hope was to raise a flawless lamb. One without blemish, one without defect so that they could actually sell it and they could actually make their living and they could actually do things. Sometimes we get so caught up in our walk that we think the most important thing is making the salary so that we can pay the bills or that we can do something fun or that we can involve ourselves in another place. We don't think about what's going on. You see, they were focused on the flawlessness of the creator of the of the beings or the animals that they were getting. But I really don't think they were focused on what they were pointing to. Think about it. If you have been watching this same thing go on all your life, and no one had ever even come and said, gotcha. Do you believe it's worth it? So I believe, you know, they're sitting here, they're knowing, hey, we've got to do this, this perfect job. It's an endless job. It always is going to be here because of the need. So they're thinking from Leviticus chapter 1, verse 3, they would have known this. If his, off, if his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer it a male without defect. He shall offer it at the doorway of the tent of meeting that he may be accepted before the Lord. We would find another passage in Deuteronomy where it says, if you and I were to bring an animal that was blemished or defected to God, it would be a detestable thing. So let me ask you, how many times do we just in the routine of life bring God to blemish God? The seconds. I know in the U.S., I don't know how many times our churches had to put together policy on how we accepted some gifts from certain things because everybody wanted to give us their used couch. <laughs> their beat-up system of something. In other words, it's no good to me anymore. Give it to God. How many times do we come back? I want you to understand, God saw that as the best. And these guys knew that. So they're working very hard to make sure the lamb doesn't get injured. They're working very hard that there's no blemish. They're working very hard to take care of everything. And when we look at Mosaic law, we see every time you turn around, you've got to have a blood sacrifice for this. You've got to have a blood sacrifice for that. You've got to have a blood sacrifice for that. Actually, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, in fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. 
For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Jesus' death on the cross was the ultimate shedding of blood that ended the need for anything else. And so, they had an imperfect hope. We have people that come to church all the time with an imperfect hope. They're wanting something. You know, can I live out my life in a perfect way enough that God will accept me? Will I live out my life in a way that, that somebody will notice it and that it'll be okay for, for God to be pleased with what I am? Folks, we need to understand our hope is not perfected in what we can do, but it's perfected in what God does for us. So we've got the imperfect hope. The second hope I want to point out is an inclusive hope. You think about it. If, if, if in some writings, the society in that day equated being a shepherd is just one step above being a leper. Think about that. You would think, you would relate to a leper. You would you would be inviting a leper to your home, and you probably wouldn't even be thinking about inviting a shepherd. Now, we understand that they would have been seen basically as outcasts among some of the people. Not everybody would have seen them this way. Not everybody would have understood them this way. But the general population would have been. And so their hope would have been, hey, you know, maybe someday we could be included in something. Wow, where did they ever? Because what we've got is the angel comes. It says that the angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were terribly frightened. And the angel said to them, do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news. A great joy. Which is for all people. When you're talking about that good news. This is the verb that we translate in the noun as the gospel. The angel is declaring the gospel to them. He said, I've got great news for you. You may be the outcast of society, but God's announcing to you today some amazing news. And when he comes before you, I want you to understand something. It would be the same as when we look at it, God has great news for us. In Romans chapter 10, verse 13, it says, For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. You see, no one's excluded. God didn't look across this audience and say, Oh, yeah, I'm dying for you and you and you, but uh, you're, you're questionable. You are too. That ain't what he did. God included us. Paul would look at the Corinthian church and he'd say, I, I want to remind you of something as a church. I want you to know that you are people saved by the grace of God. I want you to know where you were, what you were doing. You were beyond the opportunity for entering into heaven. So he says, hey, look, some of you were fornicators. Some of you were idolaters or adulterers. Some of you are effeminate or homosexuals. Some of you are thieves or covetous or drunkards or revilers or swindlers. But then he goes, and such were some of you. You know what that's saying? That's saying you're not beyond God's reach. I have people all the time that think, I have sinned so far. I have shamed God so much. I have turned away so often there is no way God could love me. I remember one time I had a young man that was going out with me to share the gospel. And he did this multiple times, probably 10 or 20 times that he went out with me to share the gospel. His name was Mark. And we would go and we would share the gospel. 
And then one day he came and he knocked on my door. And, you know, we would celebrate people that had been saved under the presentation of the gospel. And he came that day and he knocked on my door. And I answered the door and he says, how can I have that? <laughs> you see, I, as clearly as he presented the gospel, as, as clearly as he made it known to others, personally, you and I would have... I have, I have to believe he knew it himself. His thought was, I'm too far gone. I have sinned too greatly. I have, I have done too much. God can't ever save me, but I don't want anybody else to be like me. So I'm going to go out and share the gospel. You know, isn't it amazing? That he would work so hard to present the message of truth to others when he personally thought that it was off limits to him. I want you to understand there are people in the world, all over the world, that believe that same thing. Some of you are coming here today wishing that God would include you. I want you to understand this morning, God does. He loves you. He desires a relationship with you. He wants to get personal with you. In the Bible, he says there's no such thing as Jew and Greek. There's no such thing as male and female. There's no such thing as slave or free when you're in Christ. We're reaching. He's reaching. He doesn't want a single person to perish without a relationship with him. Wow. In Revelation chapter verse 9 it says and they sing a new song saying worthy are you to take the book and break the seals for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation I want you to understand today that you and I can have an inclusive hope because the God who loves us Included us. His message to the shepherds was an exciting message. The third type of hope I want us to see that is reflected here is we go from an imperfect hope to a perfect hope. You see, their imperfect hope was focused on the sacrifices that they could provide. Their perfect hope is on the sacrifice God provides. Because what we see here is that, you know, they, they've, been, they've been to stables numerous times. The angel says, hey, you're going to go to the stable. Wow. Been there, done that. You're going to see somebody born. I see sheep born by the thousands all the time. But you see, they've never seen the land. <clears throat> It changed everything. So, it says, for today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This is a sign for you. You, shall, you will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And you know, even when they all the population that would have gone to Bethlehem for the purpose of the census. I imagine Jesus would be the only one that was born that night 